Hello everyone, welcome to another video by Cheenta.com. I am Rajdeep Ghosh. Today's video will be about prime numbers, a very well known and very deep topic in number theory. Um, the question that we'll be talking about is, is there a polynomial formula for them? What that means, we'll talk about later. The contents of today's discussion will be, what are prime numbers? Um, how are they the building blocks of natural numbers? I shall not dwell on it for too long. The more th important thing that we're talking about is how we can view natural numbers in a certain way that helps us interpret divisibility criteria in general divisibility problems as problems about prime numbers. Um, the relevant problem that we'll be talking about is the impossibility of the existence of a polynomial formula for prime numbers. Again, what that means, we'll come to it later. A not to the famed prime number theorem will be made. Uh, prime, uh, the prime number theorem is a, a well-known non-trivial bound for prime numbers. It uh, It is a remarkable result in analytic number theory. Obviously, at the end, there will be a, a challenge problem for all the viewers. The best comments, and these include solutions to the challenge problem, we'll get a mention in the next video. The best responders over a month will be considered for the Ramanujan Scholarship at Chinta.com. What is a Ramanujan Scholarship? Feel free to pause here and read about it. Right, the problem. I've said it two times before already. So, what we're trying to show is that there does not exist a polynomial Px with real coefficients. Uh, we could, might, we might as well have restricted our attention to uh, integer polynomials, with, that means polynomials with integer coefficients, but it doesn't really make a difference. We'll be actually proving a much, much stronger statement than what is given here. So that we, we want to show that there does not exist a polynomial p of x, such that p of i is equal to p i, where p i is the i's prime number. Note what this means. It means that you cannot find a polynomial formula for the prime, for the prime numbers. So that means that there does not exist some nice function f of x, uh, which is a polynomial such that f of 1 is the first prime number 2, f of 2 is the second prime number 3, and so on. And in this way, you could generate all, you could very nicely predict all the prime numbers. You want to show that there does not exist such a polynomial. This is the problem we'll be discussing. Uh, but before we come to the problem, I'll try, I want to talk a little bit about what prime numbers are. Uh, most of you already know that a number is called number, natural number n is called prime if the only two devices that it has are 1 and the number itself. And this is what a prime number means. Composite numbers, on the other hand, like 8, are products of prime numbers themselves, which is uh, what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says. We'll come to it in a second. A composite number is just a number which has a divisor other than the number and 1 itself. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic, FTA, not to be confused with the FTA from fundamental theorem of algebra, says that any natural number, any n element of n, is a unique up to ordering ordering product of prime numbers prime numbers prime numbers this means is that you can write any natural number n as some product and i'm making this con conscious decision of writing the separate uh, of we usually is to be written as p1 cube but i'm just writing it as p1 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 p2, p2, and so on, up to some pn, pn, and so on. So this is what, what the fundamental theorem of algebra says. Why should this be true? You start, you start with some natural number n. If the only two divisor it has, it divises it has are 1 and n itself, then clearly this is a prime and we're done. You just stop. p is equal to n. This is what we have. If it does, in fact, have a non-trivial divisor d that is not 1 or p, then d into n by d, which is also a non-trivial divisor, would be a product of n. If these two are primes, if both of these are primes, we'll stop. Otherwise, we'll continue the same process with d and n by d. This process must stop because the numbers are getting strictly smaller. Since d is not uh, the n itself and it is a divisor of n, it must be strictly less than n. The same holds for n by d. And since the numbers are getting smaller and smaller, the process must eventually stop. And when it does stop, you, all you'll have is prime numbers left. So this theorem, uh, it allows us to view natural numbers uniquely as multi-sets of prime numbers. What is a multi-set? It's nothing special. It's just a set that allows multiple occurrences, multiple occurrences of the same element, of the same element. So, so something like 2, 2, 3, although it will not qualify as a regular set, it will qualify as a multi-set. 
There's a reason why we why we relax this condition. It's because the same prime number can actually occur multiple times in the prime factorization. So we can uniquely view every natural number as a multiset. For example, if we write eight, then the multiset will be two to two. If we write twelve, it will be a multiset. And equality is not exactly what we mean by equality. It just sort of it corresponds to corresponds to two to three and so on. This actually opens up a lot of avenues. Think about what divisibility means here. That a number a divides a number b if and only if the multiset corresponding to a small a, which will which is just a convention we are adopting that the multiset of corresponding to n is capital N. If and only if a is a subset of b. Why must this be true? Let's take an example. We know that six divides twelve. The multiset of six is two three. The multiset of twelve is two two three. And this makes perfect sense. That if that uh, a divides b, if and only if the multiset a is a subset of the multiset b. And why must this be true? Because the same prime factors must even must actually go into this. So this is a very nice observation we make that a that a number a divides a number b, if and only if the multiset a is a subset of the multi of the multiset b. Now this actually makes the idea of a GCD much clearer. So what is for, so what does that mean? So we so um, what is a common divisor in this idea then? So a common divisor is such a d that it divides both a and b. What does that mean? That the multiset capital D corresponding to d is a subset of both a and b, which means that d is actually a subset of the intersection. If you take two and three, then the intersection of say six and twelve, the multi multi sets of these are, are is two and three. So, well, any any subset of this set, the, so any subset of the intersection is a common divisor. In fact, the GCD of a and b corresponds in exactly to the multi set to the, to the intersection of the multi sets a and b. Think about it; it is the largest number. That divides both a and b, so that must be it. Must be the largest possible intersection. Well, that's not exactly well defined, but uh, I think the idea is clear. It's the entire, every single prime number that occurs here. You multiply them all, and you'll get the GCD. This actually now, this this is a, this gives us a nice result. If d is a common divisor of a and b, and d must in fact be a divisor of the GCD. Any common. This is true for any common divisor. And why is that? Because any common divisor is a subset of the intersection. This is what we showed here. And again, by this, and so since D is a subset of a intersection B, this must hold because the multiset of multiset of D small D is capital D, and the multiset of GCD A B is an A intersection B. So D must divide GCD of A and B. Do you see how nice uh, how this lends us a nice pictorial representation of natural numbers in general? For example, what is the LCM? It's a union. Think about why that that should be true. It just takes in all the prime numbers. In fact, this this also lets us. So if a was well, the canonical factorization was this, and we'll just take uh, the most primes. So like, say even though b may not have the prime factor p one, we'll just write it. We'll just allow this to be zero, and so on. So same prime factors. So say maybe beta one and beta n. And GCD. Is p one to the power minimum of alpha one beta one and so on. Again, think about why this must be true by this analogy with multisets. And because of this LCM interpretation, this gives us another freely gives us another result that if a divides n and b divides n, then the LCM of a and b must divide n. Think about again why. Think about why this must be true. Again, think about multisets and such. So this opens up a lot of avenues. And well, I'll just leave you to think about this. This is not exactly related to our problem, but this is a nice way to think about natural numbers in general. It 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 enables us to view divisibility problems in in a much nicer way. We'll come back to our problem. We want to show that there does not exist such a polynomial. What we'll actually do is prove a much stronger problem. We'll show that there does not exist a px, a polynomial px, such that every output. Of p of x, that is, no matter what input you put in, say natural numbers only, say p t one, p two, it cannot have 
all of this cannot be just primes. So um, there must eventually be a composite number here in this sequence, p1, p2, up to pn, and so on. This cannot only contain primes. So that's that's actually a much stronger statement. Not only so this is stronger than just saying that this well these will be this will be p1, this will be p2, and so on. Saying that this cannot happen is actually much stronger than uh, saying that well the prime sequence will not happen. And this is and we'll show this. This is just a nice piece of trickery. Uh, and this is a nice fact to know in general. This is a useful fact that if p is a polynomial, then a minus b divides p of a minus p of b. Why should this be true? Write out the polynomial in this canonical form. Say this is p of x and write out what happens when well, you put in a, put in b, subtract them, see what happens. But a minus b divides p of a minus p of b in general. So what we, and this, this is a useful thing. So say p of 1 is p. Then um, what we get is that p of p, sorry, my bad, p of p plus 1 minus p of 1 is divisible by p. But I know that p of 1 is p itself. We, here we've used the, this fact. We put a equals p of p plus 1 and b equals 1 and we got that p divide p, p of p plus 1 minus p of 1, which is p. The thing is that p also divides itself. So uh, what we, we saw in one of uh, the previous video that if d divides a and d divides b, then d must divide the sum a plus b. Hence, since p divides p as well, p divides p plus so on. But if this was in fact a prime, it could not be anything other than p itself. The only prime that is that divides a prime is the prime itself. It can't be 1, it can't be 0, it can't be anything else. Since it's destined to be a prime, it has to be p itself. So p of p plus 1 is equal to p. Note that we could actually just stop here. That uh, if uh, to show the our original goal, we could just stop here. We've just shown that p of p plus 1, that the p plus 1 at entry is not the p plus 1 at prime. This does not hold because this is in fact just the first prime 2. It's 2. So we're actually done with the original problem, but we'll continue on solving this uh, stronger problem. So say so p of p plus 1 is equal to p. Similarly, we could show that p of 2p plus 1 minus p of p plus 1 is divisible by p again because 2p plus 1 minus p plus 1 is p. But again, p of p plus 1 is p and by the same logic as before, this is p. So well, I, can, I also have p divides p. So we can add these two and get that p divides 2p plus 1. In this way, what we get is that and again, this cannot be any, the only prime this can be is just p itself. So what we get is p of np plus 1 is equal to p for all n. But we saw this in the first video that I, uh, that, uh, that I created for Chinta, is that no polynomial can, uh, that can vanish on infinitely many points. But the thing is, if I look at the polynomial p x p plus 1 minus p, then this is 0 for all x equals 1, 2, 3, this in fact must then, then be the zero polynomial. This means that for all x element of r. The thing is, if, if we let x vary over all the elements of r, we can just let this, we can take x to be anything, we actually get that p of x is the constant polynomial. Maybe this is a little hard to digest, but since x has free range, we can just, so say you want the value y over here, and we can just set, well, x to be, you want, you want x p plus 1 is equal to y, you can solve this, you can set x to be y minus 1 by p, and if you put it in here, you'll just get p of y equals p, for all y element of r, which means it's just a constant polynomial, but this is against what we want to. The only pol okay, to be fair, we proved a slightly, slightly different thing, we proved that the only polynomial that can spit prime values is just the constant polynomial. There is no non-constant polynomial uh, that spits prime values. The not 2 prime number theorem that I was talking about. Prime number theorem says is that the function pi of x, which pi of n, which counts the number of primes till n, is actually, is actually, uh, say, I, I, it's of the, we usually say it's of the order n by log n. 
Uh, you can ignore this part. You can skip this part of the video. It's slightly non-trivial. But it, what it says is that, that the number of primes up to up to n. So say if you say that if he has a number of primes up to ten, you will say it's since there's two, three, five, seven. The number of primes is four. So pi of ten is four, and so on. Pi is a function here, not the value pi. And what this means is that this is a good approximation, and the approximation gets better and better the larger values n you take. The thing is, this actually guarantees that. Uh, since a polynomial, any non-constant polynomial will grow at a linear rate, it will grow much quicker that if a polynomial formula were to exist, it would go too far too quick to, to keep up with this x by log x. x by log x is less than x for say all x greater than 10. And so it would grow far too quickly to keep up with this polynomial. So a polynomial fu uh, formula is not possible simply by the virtue of the fact that the prime counting function is it grows rather slowly. And so that was the nod to the prime number theorem. It doesn't mean too much. It's just a nice way of thinking about why simple things should be true. Um, a recap of the underlying ideas are here. Uh, feel free to read through it. It's, it's not uh, something I've not said before. And here's the challenge problem. Feel free to try it and leave uh, nice solutions in the comments. Thank you so much.